Um, just to get started, uh, a bit of a background to, to what we mean when we talk about fair food prices. Obviously, a lot of, a lot of meaning in that, uh, a lot of different challenges facing consumers in, in this area and many other stakeholders. Um, this, this area of work and Consumers International all year has been working very hard, especially with members in Africa, uh, on this challenge of fair food prices. Uh, we've been hearing about so many global trends, this constant tide of rising prices for consumers uh, in just about every country around the world, contrasted by the fact that actually at global commodity level on international markets, food prices have actually been falling since it's a peak in March 2021. Food prices have been falling steadily, uh, and these, these price falls at a kind of market level and not being passed to consumers. Consumers are still paying more and more to access food, uh, and farmers are not benefiting either. They're not, uh, it comes often remain stagnant or even decreasing in this kind of time of, of food crisis. Uh, so there's a clear challenge uh, somewhere in this value chain that fair food prices are not being achieved for producers, for consumers, for any of the stakeholders who need them. Um, so the causes of rising prices obviously are complex. We look at the classic three of climate crisis, of conflict, of COVID-19, uh, as all factors that are driving this uh, growing rise in food prices. But, but we also see, uh, as mentioned, that profits are rising. Uh, food companies are making record profits in this time of crisis, uh, and that's uh, a sign that this, this price rise is not all fair. Um, there's a growing risk that some actors are using this crisis to, to spike profits or to keep prices high uh, when, uh, even when prices start to fall at this global commodity level. Um, sometimes this is a result of price gouging, price fixing, kind of clear anti-competitive practices, but other times it can simply be a matter of not enough competition in our food systems, an excessive concentration of food markets, uh, allowing a small number of actors to, to really control these marketplaces uh, and causing suffering for, for consumers and for many other actors. Um, and some of the key actions needed, that will be, I think, a key focus of our discussion today. Really keen to hear about actions that are already being trialed and actions that are still needed from governments, from businesses, from consumers. Um, but certainly we're keen to look at uh, enforcement of existing competition law, taking action against those, those clearest breaches, uh, building more competitive markets, whether that's local food systems, connections between producers and consumers uh, at local level to, to deliver competition, to provide an alternative to these over-centralized, uh, over-concentrated food value chains. Um, and then, of course, providing emergency protections for consumers and for farmers in this time of crisis, uh, both to prevent prices from spiraling out of control and also in the area of social protection and ensuring that people are protected and able to access food as a, as a fundamental right. Um, so we're going to get started by hearing some opening comments from our three panelists joining us here today. Um, and so we'll hear, uh, we've asked them to keep it brief, uh, aiming for just three minutes each, which I know is not a lot of time, but we're going to ask the audience to keep it brief as well. So. Uh, I think that's, it's only fair that we um, keep it short to start with, and we'll be coming back to you for that kind of an interactive discussion. We're keen to make sure that we're bringing in perspectives from the floor, and then come back for closing comments. Uh, so yeah, very pleased to introduce our panel. We have, uh, next to me first is uh, Dr. Ojane Roba, Acting Director General of the Competition Authority of Kenya. Uh, we have Beatrice Gakuba, uh, Executive Director of the Africa Women Agribusiness Network, and Dr. Willard Mwemba, Chief Executive Officer of the Kamesa Competition Commission. So a quick round of applause, please, for our panel. <laughs> and so without further ado, let's pass over to, to start hearing some thoughts from our panel. Uh, Dr. Roba, we'll start with you. Um, to what extent, in your understanding, are rising prices in Kenya and more broadly being caused by these challenges of market concentration and other barriers to effective competition? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Charlie, and good afternoon to all the participants. Um, I think the, there is a necessity, in my view, to go back in history or even beyond COVID just to see what happened in Kenya so that uh, we better understand why we are facing the level of prices we are, we are seeing today in, in Kenya, particularly. Uh, I think we had a number of uh, external shocks uh, in the last few years, uh, ranging from uh, locust invasion in Kenya. We also had uh, COVID as one of the key parameters. Uh, we also had uh, the drought in Kenya because as you, many of you will know, uh, Kenya is an agriculture-based economy and therefore drought where much of agricultural production depend on rainfall uh, seriously get affected. And also locusts uh, affect a lot of uh, vegetation and therefore the, the short time within these events happened in the economy had a very serious impact on agricultural production uh, as a country. And, and subsequent to 
the locust invasion, the droughts, and also the, the COVID period, uh, part of our agricultural uh, input into our production and consumption system come from also, happen to have come from uh, uh, Ukraine uh, region. About 60% uh, uh, of wheat, for example, come from that region. So all these factors put together had a major impact, uh, both for domestic production and also imports uh, in that sense. Uh, this coupled with the oil prices uh, gave a lot of uh, depressed agricultural production and uh, import of prices. And then naturally, all these factors combined had a very negative impact in terms of uh, not only production, but also supply uh, chain disruptions uh, in the national economy. And this impact not only influenced uh, commodity prices, but also indirectly uh, affected uh, industries in terms of electricity and in terms of energy input into production system. And these all factors coupled together had a really major impact in terms of uh, food production and consumer prices. And therefore, this is actually what uh, in a multiple a number of ways affected uh, prices for, for consumers. Uh, I think that's what I can say for now. Maybe I can uh, revert back. But in terms of looking at the specific sectors of economy, if you look at how we define market and therefore determine concentration, the way I see it is that largely across all sectors which were affected because these variables affected the entire uh, sectors of the national economy as opposed to uh, benefiting one sector over the other. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robo. Yeah, really valuable introduction there to that problem and to, to how the Competition Authority of Kenya is addressing it. Um, and certainly really encouraging to hear uh, such a strong engagement with, with some of these challenges. Um, I think a really valuable extra perspective. We'll obviously hear a lot from this room and throughout this conference on the challenges that consumers face when it comes to fair food prices. Uh, but our next panelist, uh, Beatrice Kakuba of the Africa Women Agribusiness Network, uh, can provide a perspective on the challenges also facing uh, small-scale farmers, especially women, um, and small and medium enterprises, especially women and young people, um, and how these challenges really intersect with consumers. Uh, it's not one or the other, but really in this together. Beatrice, over to you. Thank you, Charlie. Um, this morning I was asking myself, what was I going to say today to this meeting? Because um, I was there yesterday and this is not the first time that we go to these big debates. And always uh, people think that uh, women is about gender. But this is what we do for us. It's not about gender. It's how gender access money and business. And uh, we, our organization is um, called African Women in Agribusiness. And... Um, um, it's a network that, um, and a platform that has women and youth who own those businesses. We have 4,000 um, members across uh, 44 countries in the continent and 500,000 small business women and youth. Those are not those we describe that poor or, 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 or poverty um, um, vulnerable uh, women in the area. Those are women and youth who have decided to make agriculture a business with that access to finance, with that access to market, with that access to trade information, and with that access to technology. And um, we, we, our secretary is here in Nairobi and we have an office in Ivory Coast for the Francophone countries. We, of course, subscribe to Agenda uh, 2063, the Africa we want, and SDG um, 258. But um, what really made us focus on women, this organization, is that we all know that the food we eat on the continent, I mean, in Africa, 70% is produced by women. And we're talking about fair prices here. It's that women in the end up with the women, right? But in the middle, that's what we call middle men. There's no women in it. <laughs> and we are the producer, we are the processors, we are the transformers, we are the traders, and we are the consumers because who decides in the household what food to buy and what food to eat is a woman. If it's, it's a middle class, is the woman who subcontract a young house girl who goes to the market and who, to buy that food. And who's selling on the markets? Again, women. Why are we not at the center of the discussion? Why are you not at the center of the decision making? And that's where the problem is. You cannot ignore 
the drivers of these food systems and the, you know, who determines everything and get somebody just driven by profit to, to, to do the transactions. And why our women are not involved in the, in the transactions is because they have no access to knowledge. They don't have no financial literacy. They don't know how to negotiate prices. They always, and also our social cultural barriers, the relationship between women and money yeah, is inhibiting. So we need a mindset change. And we cannot come to this, to this conference like this and ignore the women because the food prices are not set by women. They are set by middle men. So here, in, we also have um, unfair competition. I think my brother from Kenya will talk about it. I'm, by the way, from Rwanda, East African, but I'm based here. And what our, our talking points and our ask here today was just to find some answer among the people who are here. And to give, to give you just this, what we call non-tariff barriers to, to business that we, our women are facing, our business women are facing. That's, they are the ones feeding the continent. I repeat that again. And no one pays attention to them. We, of course, the unfair competition exploitation by large off-takers. Who are the large off-takers? They are the men and the cartels that we don't even know. They come and they tell you, I pay you so much. And they come at 5 o'clock when you need to go home with some food to put on the table of the children. And of course, there you don't even negotiate. You just sell at that price because you need to take some money home. So this is one thing that is you know, blocking us. And also some uh, supply chain actors, they take advantage of the supply chain. My brother talked about COVID and everything else. But I give just a small example for people who know about East Africa. We have women here in Lodwa, northern Kenya, who sell fish from Lodwa to eastern DRC on trucks. Sometimes the truck is stuck there for three days. They are, some of them have been asked to pay taxes in kind so that they can get their fish. All that things, we don't know where the competition, what are, we don't know where the government is, but it's happening. We have data, we have evidence data, because we have help, helpline. So this is also something that um, uh, we have to, to really pay attention because in that, in, in that value chain of decision making, women are not there. So is the, you're going to report to a policeman who's going to, to report to, to somebody else. It's only men. Yet they are, we are the ones who, who are carrying the burden of feeding our communities and our countries. So, so, so the fixing price, the market dominance, all those things that affect us. And uh, what we are expecting from here is... Uh, is to make sure that the anti-competitive uh, practices and the organizations that are really dealing with the, um, the uh, competitiveness and the prices that please you have to include women. If you don't include women to the table of all the decision and that it won't work. I think I'll stop. Great, thank you very much for that, Beatrice. It's really interesting to, to think about how that fits into the consumer perspective as well. I know that bringing through gender justice in pricing um, and, in, and in consumption and competition uh, is really a big priority for many of our members. Uh, a final question, a final panelist, before we move to uh, get some perspectives from the audience and we'll come back to the panel later. Don't worry, you'll have more chance. Uh, it's Dr. Mwemba. Uh, Dr. Willard Mwemba, Chief Executive Officer of the Committee Competition Commission. Uh, to what extent do you see regional and international action uh, as having a role to play in facilitating competition and tackling unfair prices for consumers and for producers and throughout the value chain? Thank you, Charlie. Uh, uh, I know you gave me very few minutes, but uh, I ask you to give me 30 extra seconds to those minutes uh, to begin with this very important point that we are all here because we ate. And even those who are fasting, they cannot fast for more than 30 days. So at least all of us have been eating somehow. And why am, why am I saying this? This underscores the importance of this subject agriculture and food markets. We cannot talk about AI, and even those who are developing AI cannot talk about that if there was no food. So we should go back to the basics. This is very important. Now, coming to your question, Charlie, um, me sitting at um, a regional level and having a binoculars for at least 21 countries in Africa, I really understand and appreciate the importance um, um, of looking at this issue at regional level. I'll give you a very practical example or practical actions that the Commercial Competition Commission 
uh, uh, is involved in. We are currently undertaking a study. In fact, we concluded that study. It's called the African Market Observatory uh, in collaboration with the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. And in that study, it became very clear that uh, we have very few dominant frames across the entire agri value chain operating in almost all the uh, member states. So same frames, very few in number, dominating the agricultural value chain in the same member states. So that underscores the importance of us as member states and us as citizens and consumers from different countries to collaborate more because these are the same companies that we are dealing with. My sister here passionately spoke about uh, the, the middle uh, main, the middle main. And I want to assure you that us coming from competition authorities, we will not leave you behind because we don't look at who is the middle man, female or male. We look at competition. But you raised a very important issue that it is these middlemen that have dominated. So they will engage in uh, uh, unconscionable conduct, if I may use that term, pay the farmer a low price, okay, buy the product, process it, and sell it to the consumer at a high price. That's why we have seen this poverty exacerbating. So we really need to cooperate more. We need to work more to address these issues. And one other thing also, Charlie, that is important uh, and worth mentioning, as I've been doing this work across member states, some of the problems, and as she rightly mentioned as well, are created by our own governments. Now, I'm not here to criticize governments, so please let me, uh, don't have me fired, okay? <laughs> I'm not here criticizing governments, but I'm talking about the facts that are on the ground, and sometimes governments engage in these things with a broader view of thinking they are saving the interest of their citizens. But the consequences uh, is something that they do not foresee. And also the lobbying power of these traders that we are talking about. He come from a country in Zambia, and I will not be shy to say, these companies who have the lobbying power to convince the government to close the market so that imports do not come in there in the country, as, uh, otherwise they would, they, 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 they would die. They would, be, they would be taken out of the market. But that doesn't help anyone. That protection, in other words, in fact, does not result in them becoming more efficient because they are very relaxed. And the one that suffers at the end of the day is the consumer. So those government policies, I think, it should also be incumbent upon us, the technocrats, to advise governments on some of the consequences of those important export bans I've seen export bans in Zambia. I've seen import bans in Kenya where we are. And I hope they will not deport me for saying this, but it has happened in the study that I'm talking about. Then um, uh, finally, uh, from, from my side, uh, uh, at least for now, um, uh, is the poverty levels among the small scale farmers. Obviously, this is, ex is exacerbated by the factors that I've talked about here. Uh, when I was born some years ago, some of my relatives were small-scale farmers. So we would categorize them as small-scale farmers, uh, then uh, uh, up to commercial farmer, forgotten the level that was in between. But those people, instead of graduating from being small-scale farmers, at least to the next level before they become commercial, they've even gone down to what we call peasant farmers, because situations have been becoming worse and worse. While the so-called middlemen that she mentioned, we see them amassing huge profits over and over. So the poverty, we should really talk about it, and again, government should come in that area. What has ex exacerbated that poverty and that situation? Lack of infrastructure. As she said, most of this food is grown, number one, yes, by women, and what type of women? I believe it's that, that type of, actually she's not that, that type of women. What type of women? Those in the rural areas, very poor. They don't have infrastructure. They have no infrastructure to, uh, for example, storage infrastructure after the harvest. So what they do immediately after the harvest, they are desperate to sell that produce to this same middleman, who will then store it properly and at the right time inflate the price. 
So we should look at uh, all those factors. And that report I'm talking about, the African Market Observatory, has raised much more things. Uh, um, it's, it's unfortunate we only have limited time. So I can't talk about all those things. But uh, once uh, we conclude very soon, we'll put it on our, on our website for everyone to look at it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Mwemba, and thanks to all our panelists. I think a really valuable case study there almost of looking at grassroots level, at national level, at international level, in this East African context, we see the same problems, all seeing the same challenges, um, and begs the question of why it's, it's been so difficult to, to deliver action in so many areas. I think we've got into some of the, these trade-offs and challenges in engaging different parts of government that we face. But I think something really interesting about this topic is the relevance more broadly. It manifests very differently in so many different parts of the world. Um, I'm sure some of the points raised uh, in this African context will resound with many of you. Uh, others will be different. Um, so I think it'll be really interesting to have, as the next part of our discussion, hearing some different perspectives, a chance to zoom out a bit maybe, think about um, some of the key questions that we've looked at, uh, how are consumers being affected by this challenge of rising prices, uh, to what extent in different contexts are these price rises being caused by issues such as market concentration, trade distortion? Is this a challenge that resounds in other regions, in other parts of Africa, in other parts of the world? Um, and then also, what are some of the solutions that are, that are most urgently needed, either they're being implemented and tested in different contexts, or that, that no one is trying, but that we need to be looking at to deliver action on this? Um, and then also, of course, what role can consumer groups play in driving this forward, uh, whether that's in partnership with governments, with farmers, with other stakeholders, and as independent advocates working with consumer communities. So I think we have a microphone somewhere at the back. Um, it'd be great if people could, could raise their hands, anyone who would be happy to uh, get us started um, with an intervention. Yeah, Agustin, please go first. Okay, let's start with Felicia. Pass behind to, to Agustin afterwards. No, you're good, don't worry, don't worry. Felicia, honestly, you go for it. You're good. Yeah, let's do it. Let's hear it. <laughs> We've got lots of time. Keen to hear from everybody. Thank you, Charlie and uh, our speakers. In fact, listening to them uh, shows that the problem is general in Africa because all of them uh, just gave us a picture from the farmers to the retailers. Farmers, you know, making all efforts and the middlemen, <laughs> whether I call the middlemen or whatever name, they buy, then place their price, sell to the retailer. And even the retailer, because of the points they also mentioned, infrastructural problems, rules, and others, transportation, they are glad to just wait, get from these middlemen. And even when they travel to get, that means, in fact, that means they're growing. That is why they're able to travel. When they travel, they also put their mark up. Who suffers? It is the consumer that suffers. So now that the problem has been identified, I didn't introduce myself, Felicia Monye from Nigeria. <laughs> Felicia Monye, uh, President of Consumer Awareness Organization. So uh, they don't grow. That's even one thing. Uh, he mentioned it. The farmers, they just remain at that level. And of course, he mentioned maybe uh, middlemen processing. That's even when they want to add value. At times, they don't add any value. But they add a, a very high markup. When Beatrice was speaking, she also emphasized that trend from the farmer to the middleman to this other, to the retailer. So what do we do about this? Because the consumer is the, is the loser, so to say, because that is the person that will bear the ultimate increase in price. I'm talking about fair prices for healthy and sustainable diet in Nigeria. I'm happy to announce that we're uh, participating in the project on fair food prices. And uh, it's been launched, and Charlie and Devin, uh, uh, the, the um, CI representatives, and of course, they're doing a, a lot of work. We've been able to rely on existing data. 
And even the existing data, you just see this trend we are talking about. But now, with any time from now, we will have our own uh, homegrown grown, uh, the grown data because we have collected food prices at different three levels for the month of November. So after the analysis now, we begin to have results that we can compare with the secondary uh, prices that we have from Bureau of Ch National, National Bureau of uh, um, Statistics from Food and Agriculture Organization, United Nations and others. So we need research. And of course, uh, CI representatives have also been emphasizing this. We need research, more research, to know what is happening and to know the solution. We need solutions to the problem. We need enforcement. And the competition agencies should come in. You know, for the middlemen, they don't feel that the, that the prices are charging is even unfair. They feel that it's fair, after all, that the ones benefiting. But for uh, consumers, of course, we are <laughs> the, the losers. The farmers may not, they are just there. Nobody to, to intercede for them. Nobody to intervene. They, you know, living at that poverty level. And of course, they have mentioned uh, the factors, the causes, and all the effects you have. You have um, lack of preservation. And because they cannot preserve the food, during the season, you know, you just see every food item being very cheap, very cheap. But out of season, every food item is expensive. So question now, how do we help the farmers? Because I, I, I pity them. When you go to the farms, you just pity them and their workers, everybody living at subsistence level. It's unfair, and they're the ones feeding the country. In Nigeria, for instance, all these um, um, peasant farmers are the ones feeding the country because almost every family, you have a farmer, and they're the ones feeding everybody. But look at their level. They can't even send their children to expensive schools. Yes, middlemen that will just wait and once a month or something, they gather whatever they want to gather, put the price, any price they want, and sell. The retailer can, may not even be able to get to the middleman because or be, 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 the middleman close to him or her because of the bad rules. So we talk to government, we talk to the uh, competition authorities, we, we talk to middlemen. Farmers have no choice. Of course, they, feel they, they would like to, to sell at a very high price. Consumers will want to sell uh, to buy at a very reduced price. So we are hoping that uh, other organisations should also do um, um, research, should sponsor research, just like uh, CI is doing. Because you need data for you to do advocacy. You don't just keep quoting 50% uh, of this, 30% of this, 90% of people are hungry. From where? How do you justify? If we, if, we, if we have people that can sponsor research projects and you have data that you can work with, it will help us. In Nigeria, we are doing it in, in six days, but we have 36 days. We have 36 days in Nigeria, but, so we need even to do more. Thank you. Thanks very much, Felicia. I think, yeah, a couple of points there. It'd be great to hear more from other audience members from the panel from. We'll definitely come back on that need for, for research and data um, and the need also for that solidarity between producers and food consumers, uh, both within African countries, but it's not just African consumers, of course, looking also at international value chains. What do fair prices look like uh, when the food is being consumed in the global north, but again, often very reliant on small-scale producers in, in Africa and in other parts of the global south? Um, let's go here, Damien, next, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ndise Damie. I'm from Rwanda. I work for Rwanda Consumers Rights Protection Organization. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the middleman. Uh, what we are doing in Rwanda uh, as a consumers organization, uh, we started uh, working with the government and also with the private sector to see how we can uh, work on fair prices. But uh, with the middleman, we cannot remove the middleman in the business because what we have done is to, in, to, to bring on board all uh, value chain in the food value chain. You see uh, producers, 
uh, sellers, middlemen, and even consumers. So we, we, we started wa with one sector, milk dial sector. In the dial sector, uh, we have uh, farmers, we have uh, uh, those middlemen, we call it uh, abachunda in our local language. And we have also uh, uh, processors, uh, and uh, we have consumers. We have five clusters. And the, the price was increasing day to day. But now, for now, the price is, is fixed by the, the platform. We have a national dial platform. And in the national dial platform, we organized all clusters together so that the milk uh, from, uh, from farm to uh, MCC, Milk Collection Center, is uh, the Milk Collection Center is for farmers. But before, the Milk Collection Center was for private sector. For now, the Milk Collection Center is for farmers. So we have the middleman who bring milk from farm to uh, Milk Collection Center, and from milk collection center, uh, milk uh, goes to uh, uh, milk sellers, and from milk sellers for processors, so consumer can get uh, safe milk because through the value chain, if the value chain work well, all activities will also work well on the price, on the quality, and even on the. Uh, uh, on the competition. So uh, I'm really uh, happy with your introduction about involving women in the business and regarding the poor women at the household level. And also we have involved women even in the middleman, the cluster of uh, from farm to milk collection center. Women are involved because if women are involved you know that women are not like because sometimes uh, there is some speculations which involve the increase of price those speculation from from middleman if women are there speculation will, will not be there thank you very much thank you Damien. Thank you. I am Agustin from uh, BEUC, the European Consumer Organization. It has been an extremely interesting to hear your, your experiences. In, in Europe, actually, we are also facing um, one of the highest price um, increases in, in food uh, for you know, different reasons. And there is a phenomenon that we call gridflation. The fact that we have inflation in Europe, but the prices have increased so much that did not correspond with the cost that they are being borne by the, the companies, being the, you know, from the producers to the distributors and the, and the, and the retailers. Uh, and what is really interesting, and I'm very glad that there are competition agencies in the, in, in the room, was that when we look at our toolbox, abuse of dominant position or anti-competitive agreements, are not enough because basically everybody is doing exactly the same thing. There is these expectations by consumers that prices will go up, so why not increase it just a little bit more? And everybody takes a little slide from the cake, and at the end of the day, what you have on the market are products that have increased sometimes even 100% of the price, which is totally unrealistic compared to the real costs that are caused by the, by the inflation. And of course, the different discussions we have, whether we could have better tools in order to intervene in these markets to address these systemic problems. But there is also one fundamental aspect that we have not really discussed seriously, generally speaking, which relates to the concentration. And why we have these levels of concentration in the market that enable then the companies to increase these prices is because we, have a, we had an extremely lax approach to merger control. The fact that we had led companies to merge and create these you know, international global conglomerates that are the ones that are at the end of the day responsible today for all these uh, food price increases that we are seeing across the world. So I would also love to hear from, from your perspective, the great agency, what can we do more in, in terms of merger, merger control? And I, I do believe there is also responsibility uh, from you know, the leading agencies that actually have also 
set the pace about how we have been so lax in enabling market concentration. But the question is, what do we need to do to go, to go back and create more competition at the, at the different levels of the supply chain? Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Let's get a couple more comments, then we'll come back to the panel. I can see you're all uh, keen to respond to a lot of these points. Chiso, please go ahead. Hello, Chiso, uh, Consumer Advocacy and Empowerment Foundation. And I'm really excited in the things that I'm hearing as uh, one of the par partners to the data collection um, across the different value chains in Nigeria. What we are seeing is some of the challenges you've mentioned about middlemen, but um, in our particular instance, it, it, there's also other issues, food security. You cannot have uh, fair food prices if, you, if there's no food security. And for us, some of our uh, food uh, production areas have very bad security challenges. Um, stories of uh, f uh, taxation by bandits on the farmers automatically increases prices. Um, you, uh, the gentleman just talked about the monopoly and the mergers of these conglomerates. Um, we may not have them that, but we also have the mergers of the middlemen, <laughs> where they all come together uh, to form a coalition and, uh, and agree at very unrealistic and unreasonable prices. But what I'm really interested in hearing more of is what the gentleman mentioned about the lobbying, that you did mention that uh, this other are good at lobbying the governments and say, ban this, stop that, don't do that. I, I think it's also time for us to look at us developing some lobbying um, tactics that actually inform the government on some of their policy decisions and the possible effects, either based from experience or, or we've seen what it's done. A um, couple of, um, about a year and a half, two years ago, they closed the borders where, in the northern states. And so we couldn't get certain types of food that flowed into our government and ours, but ours was going out, but nothing was coming in. So, and that created a, a really crazy price increase. Um, I was watching a program this week where the food sellers, for example, for rice, were complaining bitterly that they had no customers. They had rice, but no customers. The prices had gone up by over 60%. And you know we all consume rice come Christmas, but nobody's buying. Something that used to go for 30 something thousand naira per uh, 50 kilo bag is now 70. Who is gonna pay for that? And so these are some of the challenges that even everybody, if the sellers are complaining now, I don't think the middlemen are complaining, but the sellers, the consumers, and the farmers are now in dire straits. And so I would like to see if the, there should be a regional strategy of, of developing um, lobbying tactics, policies, strategies that um, organizations can utilize in order to lobby the government. Hey, thank you, Chizo. Let's have one more comment. Does anyone keep to go? I'm Prabhakar from MGP Mumbai, India. I want to say something about my uh, organization only regarding this prayer projects and sustainable lifestyle we are talking about all the time. Uh, since last 48 years, we are following that. Uh, we, are, um, uh, we have uh, consumer groups, consumer clubs, you can call that. And uh, bulk buying, we are purchasing uh, in bulk from the market and we are uh, distributing to all our members. So they get at least 20% uh, less prices, in, uh, items in less price. So that is the thing, and that too, uh, it is uh, health, uh, this thing, cons uh, cons uh, consciously uh, selected items and uh, environmental fr uh, friendly, or uh, such items we are distributing. And that I think, um, because our, uh, this thing is, we, we say that it is reasonable price. 
not we say fair, we say reasonable reasonable price and standard uh, items so that kind of mis uh, distribution we are running since last uh, 48 years and we have limited this thing i know but this can, this model can be uh, can be replicated in other countries also zimbabwe has tried some uh, years uh, before and now also they are interested they have shown interest in uh, this, uh, uh, this system the distribution system so please note uh, this this uh, unique model for sustain, sustainable lifestyle uh, this is our distribution from mgp oh Thank you very much. We'll come back round in a moment. There's still more time, but I think we're keen to hear from the panel, get a bit of another uh, intervention before we come back round. I think really a lot to reflect on there, um, hearing about the need for stronger data and research to drive action on this, hearing about the need for, for, for lobbying, for convincing governments when we have the information, but action still isn't happening, uh, about a new toolkit, what are the things that we're not considering as solutions at international level, at national level, um, and then what are the more the grassroots solutions, new, new marketplace models that can connect producers and consumers and, and challenge concentration at that grassroots level. Um, maybe let's go back down the way that we came. If you're happy to go first, Dr. Robo, any reflections on uh, some of these points that we've heard? Uh, thank you very much, Charlie. Uh, I would like just to make two, two comments on uh, the discussion that we are having here. Uh, one is relating to the, to the major <coughs> issue and abuse of dominance. Uh, I would like to just state that uh, as a competition agency uh, in a liberalized market, we, we don't control prices. But uh, what is important is the, the outcome uh, in terms of how that price is determined, which is of concern to us. And I think that's where we meet with the consumer interest. Uh, in terms of mergers, uh, looking at what are the factors behind price increase and the trend in merger within our national economy, is the only thing we have seen is that there is increase in major uptake in uh, flower and health sector. Those are the sectors that we have seen there is change in number of majors that have been brought to us uh, that we have questioned what is happening and uh, we even went out to find out what is happening in the, in the sectors uh, to establish if there are anything that we not understand that's coming out. Uh, having said that, I think the other important fact that we are looking at of late is majors and, and the sort of major type that in most cases we look at uh, mergers which entails data, not uh, the traditional way of looking at assets uh, and turnovers. Then this is now an area that uh, as a competition authority we are looking at in terms of how do we determine uh, the value for data, how do we move forward, look at mergers that are brought to us in a different way than what we used to do traditionally. So with regard to mergers, I think that's what I can say and then Issues of dominance, I think, is a very important factor, especially if you tie it with the sort of data we are looking at. Our data is becoming the, the, the gold of, of the future, maybe moving forward, with the digitization of all the sectors of the economy and certain farms which are dominant, maybe in their, uh, in their structure, have amassed a lot of data over the years. Uh, they might not seem to be uh, dominant or abusing their power with the data they have but maybe they're using that, that algorithms to determine or even understand consumer behavior and projecting what is going to happen with their consumer prices and therefore the supply. So I think that's what I would like to mention with us to abuse of dominance and major behavior that we have seen in the recent years. Uh, what I can also say that uh, mergers also when you look at it in terms of uh, one jurisdiction uh, might be misleading and therefore you might make a different decision if you look at mergers in the neighboring countries like uh, for example if you're working with Comesa for instance where we work together closely uh, if we will have looked at mergers that have uh, been brought to our attention and also consult the regional uh, agencies like Comesa and see what do you see in, in this space uh, I think that's a very important uh, area that we are looking at the other thing with regard to merger is uh, what we are doing is that in the past we have always brought to the attention of the public merger uh, that has been brought to us and determined only at the tail end, when we have already determined, analyzed, and determined the merger. What we want to do now, moving forward, is the moment a merger is brought to us, we want to put out there in the public and say this merger has been brought to us as if we've been analyzed, so that people can bring their opinion in terms of what do they know about this merger, so that we have prior information as we analyze that we don't deny uh, the general public that opportunity to look at major 
uh, in the initial stages of uh, notification to us. Thank you. Sorry about the yeah, Beatrice, please go ahead next and remind us, uh, yeah, keep comments brief so we can get around for uh, some more, more thoughts. But yeah, keen to hear your thoughts, some reflections on some of those comments. Okay, thank you. I think uh, most of the questions really um, were very pertinent of what you know we've been discussing and I wish we had more time but even even two days will not be enough because we're talking about food and food is a basis of everything of livelihood and for me I come back to the point that the person who manages the food in the, whether it's the family in the consumer uh, value chain is a woman so I, my plea is again to to um, really to support women um, networks, you know, for advancing uh, advancing the agenda, for increasing voice. Uh, to your question, uh, uh, Felicia, we have evidence-based information because we have a platform. So we have profiles of all those women, even the informal sector. There is no such thing as informal. So you cannot say the whole continent of Africa is informal because 80% of the food we eat and we have evidence that is produced for, by women. We just um, I concluded a, a workshop in Mombasa from the Northern Corridor. Northern Corridor is Kenya, Burundi, Rwanda, Eastern Congo. And we had uh, uh, traders, women traders from all those six countries, and South Sudan, for six countries. And they were very, we had a lot, they had a lot of information. Those are young women with university degree, with a smartphone, we have apps, we have helpline on the borders, everything. But what I did not hear, uh, until now is the political will. I think my, my brother from Comesa mentioned that. The, and, the, and the example that Damien, my compatriot, gave is that where is there, there is political will, it happens. Damien, you know, the, the, the thing is that in Rwanda, he's my compatriot, it's intentional that half of the, the parliament are women, everything is women, so, and it, it did not come from the, the will of the people. It came from direction is a political will. So this is very important, the mindset, and I think um, to the point of my, my two brothers here, as a women organization uh, representative, I think uh, people have to start listening to their mothers, to their sisters, and to their daughters, because they are the driver of the, of the food system. But also there's one statistic that we should not ignore when we talk about food prices is that there is also a food crisis. We don't have enough food. You know, in every African country that we are speak, talking to here, most of 60% of the food we eat, I'm just giving an average, is imported. We have some countries even import onions and tomatoes, yeah, because of the big companies. They produce tomato paste, you cannot compete with them because our women, to your point, they cannot process and they sell to the cheap price because they, they rot. We don't have processing facility. We don't have cold chains. You know, I used to be in flowers, cut flowers, exporting to Amsterdam, so I know what I'm talking. Before, when I exit the international organization, I went to business, so I know what it is. When our flowers got to Amsterdam, they give us a low price because they said Africa have no standard, this and that, yet my manager was a Dutch. So, I mean, there is also a lot of, uh, uh, competition and hidden competition on the value chain, hidden competition. However, if we don't have political will, it will not happen. The average farmer in Africa is 60 years old and still tilling the land with a, a traditional hoe. If you're a woman, 60 years old, how many grandchildren you have? How much can you till the land? And the labor is cheap. It's very cheap. I mean, half a dollar per day, it doesn't add up. So I think we have to be intentional and bold on how we do the situation analysis of what is happening. We have brilliant minds. I mean, I don't think we lose our job, <laughs> but we have to be bold and say the, speak the truth. You cannot compete with Nestle. We can, cannot compete with Del Monte if you are in Kenya. How much are they getting, you know? Food determines how much money in the household you're going to be left with. Because the first item of expenses in the household is food. If you're going to pay 50% of your income on food, what is left? It determines your livelihood, where you're going to send your school. I was telling my sister of the World Bank that poverty is about income level. And the only thing that in the rural areas our women or our youth have to sell is agriculture, where there's no technology. 
where there's no access to finance, flexible and affordable. It's not there. So what are we talking about here? But still, we still have something to do. And that's where the collaboration, we were talking about it earlier before we come, that's where the collaboration come in and lobbying and consistent lobbying. We have something that COVID has brought that the one positive thing is about the social media and the digitalization. Although we still have a lot of gaps in our digitization on the continent, but each of these young people and everyone has a smartphone. So if we cannot be heard, those young people, when they're hungry, they will talk. But we have to make sure that they have the right content. We're not here to fight the government. We're here to help the government. And we want the government to hear us. But when there is no political will, it will not happen. And that's why we will have to all collaborate, create good content, work together, bring, back the, bring in those major and those big companies to, to tell them that it is not fair for you to buy a kilo of coffee for two dollars and sell it to $12 at the international market. So you're making money on a poor person in Africa, and that's, it's not in order. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. Uh, over to you, Dr. Mwemba. Uh, quick reaction to some of these comments that we've heard from the floor. Thank you. I'll start with the gentleman on, uh, on majors. Okay. Uh, I've done majors all my life, actually. Yeah, from school, I started doing majors, and I agree with you 100%. Uh, that competition authorities, uh, whether in Africa or where elsewhere, Europe, we have actually allowed that situation because of this merger thing. And why we are even so casual about it, we usually begin with a statement, oh, most majors are not anti-competitive. Uh, we don't need to be much more serious with them. Let's focus on cartels and abuse of dominance. But one gentleman told me that, do you know that a, a merger is simply a legal cartel? He said cartel, and uh, we, as in competition law, we say cartels are the supreme evil of antitrust because companies come together to collude to fix you, the, the consumer. And he said, well, these measures that you are thinking are innocent. Think about it. They are simply a legal cartel, and they become legal because you sanction them. So I agree with you that we need to do much more on measures and remove this presumption that actually measures are innocent more than 95% of majors are approved. And then in markets that are concentrated, Dr. Dano mentions, uh, raises a very important issue. We have a company, I will not mention it uh, for obvious reasons. It, had, it was involved in a major in Zimbabwe. In Zimbabwe, so this is not anti-competitive. There are no issues here. It did the same in uh, Zambia. It did the same uh, in different uh, countries. It looked so innocent a transaction when these separate countries were looking at it individually. But when we looked it at a regional level, not, 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 not that we looked at that uh, a major from a point of view of approving at a regional level. No, just a review of what had happened in the past. Then we realized what conglomerate had been created. This company is in seed, the company is in fertilizer, the company is it's almost in everything. Uh, it is in uh, uh, cooking oil, in everything. And it did this very methodically, bit by bit. By the time we were open in our eyes, it was too late. So I agree with you, we should do more. And uh, Charlie, uh, please just allow me, this is very important. And competition authorities should speak more. The other problem I've seen with us competition authorities, we are so territorial. It's only me who should do this. I can't talk to that other guy. I can't let that other guy. It happens, and so sadly, among African countries themselves, but also between the advanced jurisdictions and those that are less, ex less experienced. When the Europeans are dealing with the same major, Bayer Monsanto is one very good major, in my view, that we should not have uh, approved in Europe, in America, or even in Africa. But we all approved it, including Comesa, where I'm coming from. It was my case, actually. It was my, personal. it was my case. We shouldn't have approved it. But why the Europeans did not want to talk to us, they said there are so many confidential issues here we can't discuss. Okay? They so, in this bickering of confidentiality, and the, you end up approving a monster. Then today, I've seen so much writing on how bad the Bayer Monsanto major was. So we should stop that and be more realistic. For the time we are bickering, there's someone that is suffering. So at the Commissar Competition Commission, I think for us now, we've engaged in more productive engagements. We have currently a major uh, that is just as serious as the Bar Monsanto. 
we are discussing with our colleagues in Brazil who have similar concerns on that major. So I agree with you, um, we can do more. Coming to my two sisters lastly, I think your points are similar. Uh, what can we do then? We have all these problems. This is what I said even yesterday in my opening remarks. I said we've talked and talked. We've done research and research. Uh, she's, she's talking about research that Consumer International has done. She's talking about some research that they've done. I spoke about the market, Africa Market Observatory research that we have done. We've done research and research. I've read so many researches. Some of them were done even before I was born and I use them as literature reviewing some of the research I'm doing. We keep on researching doing what? We should be more practical with what we research about. Okay. So what is it that we should do? And my view is we should be more aggressive to disseminate the results of those research uh, projects to those who matter, those who make these policies. I know it's, it's not easy, but it won't help us just to come up with, there are so many researchers that are just shelved. So it's not easy, but I think we should change focus now. More aggression into advocacy and dissemination. And again, the Africa Market Observatory I'm speaking about, what we are doing at Comesa is that come January, February, we are attempting to bring all ministers of trade and agriculture and Comesa member states to tell them about some of those, uh, uh, some of those uh, issues that we've discovered. Uh, then lastly, on the same issue, the other thing is we ourselves are a danger. And, and I'll be very honest with this, uh, forgive me if I'll be too frank. I've observed that most consumer movements in our member states are one-man show or one-woman show. There is no leverage. It's, if that person is, the, is not there, the, then the organization is dead. Why do we have so many fragmented consumer associations and consumer bodies that our voices cannot be heard? Why is it that even amongst ourselves we are saying these guys are lobbyists, they are lobbying the government, but us we've chosen to operate uh, separately, for, obviously for selfish reasons, unfortunately I'll say that. Why can't we come together as associations, consumer associations and other like bodies so that we have this bigger lobbying power if that's what we are looking for? I know so many consumer associations in our countries that are one or two man show. There is nothing much that will come from there. If you want to be listened to, numbers are important. Thank you very much. Just a moment, we're really running out of time. We started a little bit late, so we can go on. Uh, a couple more comments from the floor, really very brief, one minute maximum. Um, if anyone has any reactions to those or anything else they want to share on this topic. Any hands, or have we, we finished the conversation? Yeah, Rose on the right. Thank you very much. I, I feel that I also need to share about our work in the food uh, monitoring of prices. Um, I come from Consumer Council of Zimbabwe. We embark on what we call the monthly family basket of six. So we carry out weekly surveys to look at the prices. And I, I would like to share that um, my country is a hyperinflationary environment and the prices keep changing. Um, this year, particularly in 2023, we were very interested in the price of bread because um, Zimbabwe for the first time achieved with self-sufficiency so we could we, we could have managed to decrease the prices of bread, but that did not happen. In fact, the prices kept going up. And so we challenged um, the national uh, millers to say, why, why is it that flour continues to be this high in terms of price? And I mean, they would have all this technical jargon to say, no, we can't have it lower because of A, B, C. And we said, but over the years, you have been citing imports of flour. And um, obviously, there will be other components for the ingredients of bread, but that did not satisfy us. What they then did at National Bakers um, Association level, some of the members went on to decrease the, the weight of bread 
because in my country, it's a standard loaf is supposed to be 700 grams. So we, we then discovered there were loaves of bread which were way under the stipulated uh, um, weight, going down as far as 450 grams. And we complained to the Ministry of Industry. So they gathered all the... Um, stakeholders, the National Bakers Association members, and also even the, um, the, the, the trade measures department people, they came, we were all there, and we demanded that the price, uh, I mean, the, the, the weight of bread for the next day should go back to 700 grams, or else uh, they should close. So government uh, agreed to that, and we managed to solve that. But I must say that um, as a country, really, we struggle a lot with prices of food, and it's always a challenge. So we even went to the extent of complaining. We complain because every month we give them the, the prices, and they see, they, they could tell that prices were going up, and they, they opened the borders to allow for imports. And I mean, most people prefer to eat local food, but when the prices are too high, they, they have no option. So the borders were opened, um, and a, a statutory instrument was issued, and we started seeing prices go, going down because of the competition from across the borders. And it has worked um, for some time. We just hope that it will knock sense into our um, um, retailers and uh, the middle people. The farmers, we can't blame the farmers. They charge very reasonable prices, but it is the middlemen who give us problems because they want to profit here and they, they make much, much more money than what the farmers are getting. We could share a lot on these issues. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Rose. Uh, I think really we should wrap up there because um, I know we're running over. Uh, but please do keep talking to us afterwards. This is not the end of the conversation. We're here, we're here all week. Sadly, I'm here all week. Uh, really keen to hear more about what you're doing, what the solutions we're needing. Um, and yeah, as like panelists keep telling me, this needs to be the start of the conversation, not just a one-off. Let's really think about what we can do. There's been a lot of, a lot of calls to action for consumer groups throughout this session. So yeah, looking forward to building on this. Uh, so a final round of applause to everybody, and thank you very much. <laughs>